on this edition of Native Report. We tour the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. We learn about the sculpture garden of the Mohegan Nation. And from the Native Report archives, we pay tribute to Navajo code talker Chester Nez. We also learn something new about Indian Country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community and the Blandin Foundation. Welcome to Native Report, I'm Stacy Thunder. At 308,000 square feet, the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center is billed as the largest native museum in the world. Tad Johnson takes a self-guided tour through 20,000 years of native and natural history. In the middle of Connecticut's rolling hills stands the Mashantucket Pequot Museum and Research Center. It is the largest museum of its kind on an American Indian reservation. The museum at Mashantucket was built around two guiding principles, to show the relationship between the land and the people who have occupied it over the millennia, and to trace the prehistory and history of that occupation. To tell the story of the Mashantucket, we must begin with the land. The Wisconsin glacier that would shape and reshape Mashantucket began its formation some 75,000 years ago in the highlands surrounding Hudson's Bay. By 10,000 years ago, it was already beyond the St. Lawrence Valley, and by 6,000 years ago, it was but a small vestige of its former self, located again in the highlands of Labrador. It left behind banks of clay, sand, and gravel, and fields of boulders that mark and shape the landscape of southern New England. At Mashantucket, it left behind a large piece of itself, embedded in the other debris that, when melted, became the Great Cedar Swamp. Over the next 10,000 years, native populations increased as resources available expanded. By 1000 AD, native groups were cultivating a variety of plants, including corn, not only were there more people, but they were living together in larger groups, exploiting a range of seasonal resources. Pequot's social life was rich and diverse. Decision-making was essentially consensual, with each village having one or more sachems. There probably existed a rough division of labor between men and women, but one would expect all to pitch in as the need arose. Pequot life changed dramatically in the first decades of the 17th century with the arrival of the first Dutch traders, then English settlers. The intruders brought with them more than goods and guns. They brought smallpox, measles, bubonic plague, and possibly hepatitis, diseases that decimated native populations. By 1633, a smallpox epidemic struck the Pequots, sweeping away whole families. Perhaps as many as 4,000 Pequots succumbed to the disease. On May 26, 1637, the English, joined by their Indian allies, the Mohegans and the Narragansetts, attacked before dawn one of the main Pequot fortified villages near the Mystic River. Within an hour or so, the village was burned to the ground and upwards of 600 tribal members were dead. The war was brought to a close in September 1638 by the Treaty of Hartford, but the terms of the treaty were harsh in the extreme. Some of the tribe's members were placed under the control of the Mohegans and the Narragansetts. Others were sold into slavery. There are a number of permanent museum exhibits. Exhibits take visitors on a journey 18,000 years through time up to the present day. Botany, geology, and other earth sciences are explored in the permanent exhibits. 
Exhibitions of note include a glacial crevasse, an interactive multi-sensory caribou hunt dating back 11,000 years, a 22,000 square foot recreation of a 16th century Pequot village, a 16th century Pequot fort, an 18th century Pequot farmstead on two acres of land, demonstrations of Pequot lives, the Pequot Nation Today, and crafts and works of art by Native American artists. There are six visitor interactive computer programs at 23 stations and 12 original films. Our gardens are planted primarily with maize, beans, and squash, crops that we call the Three Sisters because they're compatible like members of the family. In the 1970s, the Mashantucket Pequot Nation brought suit for the return of land lost in the 19th century. After five years of petitioning, legal action, congressional legislation, and a presidential veto, on October 18, 1983, President Ronald Reagan signed revised legislation recognizing the tribe and settling its land claim. The success of Bingo led to the building of Foxwoods Resort Casino. But in its success, the tribe has not forgotten the need to tell its story. This museum seeks to tell that story in a scholarly, innovative, and interactive way, but it would be incorrect to think of it as a finished work. Continuing research will shape new interpretations, and the very vitality of tribal life will add new chapters. Did you know there is still a Mohegan tribe in Connecticut? The 1826 historical novel, The Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper, is set during the French and Indian War. The novel has been one of the most popular novels in English since its publication. At the time of Cooper's writing, many people believed that Native Americans were disappearing. However, in spite of the title of this book, the Mohegan tribe is very much alive. Today, the Mohegan Tribe of Connecticut is federally recognized. Their reservation is located on the Thames River in Uncasville, Connecticut. The tribe's independence as a sovereign nation has been documented by treaties and laws for over 350 years, such as the Treaty of Hartford secured by their sachem, Chief Uncas, after his cooperation and victory with the English in the Pequot War. Although the Treaty of Hartford established English recognition of the tribe's sovereignty, in 1638, after the colonial period and the loss of lands, the tribe struggled to maintain recognition of its identity. It gained recognition by the federal government in 1994. That same year, the U.S. Congress passed the Mohegan Nation Land Claims Settlement Act. This enabled the Mohegan to establish economic development on their reservation. The Mohegans note that they are bound together not only by race, but also by lineage, heritage, nationhood, and an oral tradition. The 1994 Tribal Constitution conferred membership upon those who trace their ancestry to the 1861 tribal role and who have remained involved in tribal activities. Visitors to the Mohegan Nation Government and Community Center in Uncasville, Connecticut are greeted by life-size statues that honor prominent sachems and chiefs. Next, we learn about their place in Mohegan history. A gentle wind blows across the statue garden on Crow Hill of the Mohegan Indian Reservation. These statues in front of the Mohegan Government and Community Center are memorials honoring the influential Mohegan chiefs and sachems of the 20th century. Behind me we have two very important chiefs. The man with the hat was Henry Wiegand Matthews. And Wiegand means good in our language and that was something that his people called him because he was so pure of heart. And we see him actually grinding corn Corn, we believe, feeds the body and the spirit. We call it, we watch them, but when it's ground, we call it yokiag, which means traveling food. 
Uh, traveling food has, has many purposes, mainly for hunters on long journeys, but also it's very important to nourish us spiritually. And so this is something he did. He, he kept us going during very difficult times and uh, provided for his people, both physically and spiritually. Behind him, we have Chief Mataga, and Chief Mataga's English name is Burl Fielding. And Burl Fielding was a great preserver of our ceremonies and kept our wigwam festival going. Our wigwam festival is actually like a powwow where we invite the whole world to come visit us every year in August on the third weekend in August. And Chief Mataga would cook in the cook shack and make the clam chowder and the oyster stew and wake everyone up early in the morning to make sure that things got going as they needed to. And he also held the tribe together during the difficult period of the 1930s and 40s and into the 1950s. Melissa is the Mohegan Nation's tribal historian and medicine woman. One of her responsibilities is to tell the stories of the tribal chiefs honored in this special place. I'm standing in front of a good friend of mine, Cortland Fowler. He was our chief and chairman during the 1970s, 1980s, into the 1990s. And he was a very traditional man, but he also was very political and very resolute. He was the person who was in charge of our people at the time of our first filing of federal recognition. And he went through the period in which we were initially denied that claim and had to keep things going through that time when, of course, there was a, a lot of discontent and unhappiness on the part of the tribe. He's pictured in his statue here with a headdress that was the type that was worn a lot by Eastern Indian men in his period because it was very flamboyant. It, garnered a lot of attention, but he also wore traditional roach in many of his pictures. You'll see him wearing uh, a split deer tail and porcupine headdress. Uh, his regalia is typical of, of the other men you see here with Eastern Woodlands designs. And he's carrying a hatchet because his Indian name was Little Hatchet. And the reason for that is that as a young boy, he always wanted to chop wood. So his father had to get him a very small hatchet when he was just a little boy and his hatchet screw with him. He was someone who worked very, very hard with these people in his, in his own time. Of course, there was no salary. This was just something that, that he did and devoted himself to. He was also a great proponent of protecting our burial grounds. He made sure that those things were taken care of. And in fact, uh, several of the burial grounds which we have been able to reclaim were due to his hard work, uh, places where you know, local authorities had paved over burial grounds and that sort of thing. Thanks to Cortland Fowler, we were able to reclaim those places. My favorite thing about Cortland Fowler was his stubbornness. He was stubborn in a time where that's all we had was to hang on and hold on and say no to people who were trying to harm our burial grounds, do things to our people that were unfair. Uh, sometimes people might have seen him as gruff and I saw him as resolute and I was proud to call him my friend. It was in 1994 under the leadership of Chief Ralph Sturges when the Mohegan Nation received federal recognition. The man standing behind me is Chief Gatinamog, which means he who helps you, Ralph Sturgis. And certainly he did do that. Uh, when he became chairman of our tribe, we were not a federally recognized Indian nation. And when he finished his tenure, we had been a federally recognized Indian nation for many years. And pretty much all of his dreams and our dreams were starting to come true in terms of bringing our people home. Uh, this community center that we're standing near was his idea. He said, this is the first thing we have to do for our people. We have to have a place we can gather again. Ralph Sturgis dedicated himself 100% to federal recognition. Uh, it was something that he, I think more than anyone else, understood in terms of how much it would benefit our people. Uh, some of the things in, in the East that sometimes people don't realize are that Indians can go very unnoticed here in New England. Uh, we were fortunate. We had a museum and we still have a museum. So we had some sort of a public face, but many tribes don't have that. And our reservations are very hidden. Uh, they're in the woods and a lot of people don't even know they're there. Uh, there in Connecticut, there are five Indian reservations and very few people could tell you where those are. So Ralph Sturgis worked on federal recognition and we succeeded in, in that goal in 1994. Uh, he's pictured here holding the paper in which our land is returned to us by the federal government, and that was a very important part of federal recognition. And he wore a baseball cap that said chief on it. That was one of his, his favorite things that, that, that he had. Uh, he sometimes wore a headdress, 
but the baseball cap was something you saw him in most of the time. Uh, he sometimes called himself a three-piece suit Indian because he had to travel to Washington, D.C. a lot. And uh, he had a very affable personality, and I think that's one of the reasons that he was so successful. These are the people who brought us where we are today. I, I see a little one running around here. Uh, what, what, what do you hope for that two-year-old in your family? What do you hope for those young people here? I hope that they can get an education, go on, hold on to their Indian heritage as they're doing that. Sometimes that's hard to do because when you go out, you branch out into um, a world off the reservation and off. Uh, away from your own people. Sometimes it's hard to hold on to that. But um, that's what I'm hoping for them, that they will get an education, go out in the world, and try to tell people the story. Uh, so many things are not written down, and they're handed down, you know, it's an oral language, and we need, we need other people to be able to, uh, to hear these stories, and some people don't want to hear them, you know, it, it's, and I'm sure that's common. Our story from the Native Report archives this week profiles Chester Nez a member of the all-Navajo 382nd Marine Platoon, otherwise known as the original Code Talkers. His story is one of a true American hero and warrior. As evening falls over Northland College, a welcome song by the Lakota Ray Soldiers Drum fills Kendrigan Gymnasium. The honored guest is Chester Nez, the last surviving veteran of the original 29 World War II Navajo Code Talkers. It's been a dream of mine to bring somebody of this, um, this level to our campus, to see, to show people that um, we have these people that we need to honor while they're around, to honor their story, but also to expose our young people to people who are, are fighting for culture and fighting for community and, and fight, fighting for education. Um, when I saw that Chester had received his, his degree uh, last November from, from KU, he's a rock chalk Jayhawk, we, uh, um, we were real excited, it was all over our walls and we were telling students that, hey, you know, at the age of 91, you can go back, you can get your degree, you can finish what you're doing, and, and uh, it was huge. It's, we're sending big messages to our Native youth right now that education is important, culture is important, and recognition and honor is very important anytime you do anything at any age. It's been a perfect place to visit here and I'm very glad to come here and see some of these people around here and and I'm so happy to be here. Some of these guys were in the service you know that I knew and some of them are you know, guys that were different the division and stuff like that you know but we did talk about where we've been and what we did and, <clears throat> and stuff like that you know. Assisting Chester is his grandson Latham and Judith Avila, co-author of Chester's story, the first and only memoir by one of the original code talkers. Many people think they just spoke in Navajo and that's what fooled the Japanese, but really they developed a code and the Japanese captured several Navajo men and tortured them and tried to get them to decipher the code but it was complex enough that they had no idea what was being said, even though they recognized that the individual words were Navajo. So it was a very, very clever code. It was doubly encrypted, and these guys studied like crazy to make sure they could just take a message in in English and spit it right out in Navajo like they were coding machines, computers. And they were really an impressive group of men. 
and uh, Chester is now the last of the 29 original code talkers who developed the code, and that gave a special cachet to the story because he could talk about what they were thinking when they developed the code and how they got recruited and what they were thinking when they decided to fight for their country. I mean, it was just fascinating to me. The evening presentation included several local, state, and tribal representatives honoring Chester with gifts. It also included the telling of his story, 60 years in the making. On behalf of the Oneida Nation, we brought this gift basket. Some of this is our medicines, our fruits, our, thing, our, our things all in, that sustain us. Our three sisters, corn, hull corn and all that. And this handmade basket here, this box. But there's a special gift in there for him. And it's what we call Oneida love portion, tea. <laughs> so, Chester, on behalf of the Oneida Nation and all the veterans, of the Oneida Nation, the people, would like to present this gift to you. Someone comes to get you, a Marine officer. He takes you all to a classroom and locks the door. He goes to the front of the room and he says, men, Here's your assignment. He said, we need you men to develop a code using your native language, Navajo. And it needs to be a code that not even another Navajo could break. It took us almost about a year to, to develop this code. And when we went overseas, that's the only thing we used, you know, a Navajo language made into code, you know. And it's one of the roughest things for these Japanese tried to uh, decipher the code, you know, but they never did. And it's uh, one thing I always remember, you know, it's one of the most beautiful things that ever happened during World War II. I'm very proud and very happy about that. When we came home, you know, and uh, people, people asked us all kinds of questions, you know, but I think uh, they told us when we were discharged not to talk about what we did, you know, not to tell anybody, you know. It took almost a little over 20 years before they told us it was all right to talk about it, you know. And, and that's when I told my folks and my relatives, you know, what we did. And they were so happy to know that we used our native language to develop a code and use it during the war. I love seeing the respect he gets, and I love seeing that at 92, his life is actually ramping up instead of ramping down. I think it's an important message to get our communities together for a positive event, to, to recognize not only Native communities, but also military communities, and most Native communities, those two mesh together very well. Um, culture and, and our warriors are some two of our very important connections that we need to make with Native and non-Native communities. Chester Nez was born January 23, 1931, and raised in a Navajo community in New Mexico. As a child, he was sent to a government boarding school, where his teachers washed his mouth out with soap when he spoke in Navajo. But when World War II began, the Marines realized that Navajo speakers could be used to create a code that would be unbreakable. Chester grasped the irony. He told USA Today in 2002, All those years, telling you not to speak Navajo, and then to turn around and ask us for help with that same language. It still kind of bothers me. Nevertheless, he was excited about the opportunity. I told my buddy, let's get the heck out of here, climb that mountain up there, and see what's on the other side. He and 28 other Navajos volunteered. The Marines used their code in the Pacific from 1942 until the war's end. The Japanese never managed to break it. The Code Talker's mission remained classified until 1968. 
Hollywood later turned their exploits into a movie in 2002, and in 2013, the Code Talkers received Congressional Gold Medals. Chester passed away June 4, 2014. He was the last surviving original Code Talker. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us at nativereport.org, Facebook, and Twitter. Thank you for spending time with us here on Native Report. I'm Stacy Thunder. Stacy Thunder is Ojibwe from the Red Lake and Lakota Ray Nations and is the Legislative Council for the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Professor Ted Johnson is the Director of the Master of Tribal Administration and Governance Program at the University of Minnesota Duluth and is an enrolled member of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux Community and the Blandon Foundation. Closed captioning is provided by the Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa.